Okay, so a bit about me first, and uh, 30 seconds or less. Um, I uh, live not too far from here. I live in Flemington, New Jersey, and I work down in Philadelphia at Comcast headquarters. Prior to the uh, commute to Philadelphia, I had commuted to Piscataway for a number of years, working for Bell Labs and Bellcore um, as a software engineer, and then up through um, various levels of management, uh, so they didn't code too much anymore. Uh, and then now I'm back in the CTO's office, and uh, I code pretty much every day, and I work on new technologies um, that Comcast may roll out over the next couple of years. And specific to what we're going to talk about today, I, I work a lot with video. Um, and um, I work on a number of different um, aspects. Some of the things that we're doing are streaming applications um, from the Internet across video and out to the edges of the network so we can have uh, cloud-based application services. So that's kind of a compelling use of video. But today what I want to talk about is that um, is what video is. Uh, the average American household watches six hours of video a day. Um, it's a lot of video. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it kind of boggles the mind that you know, someone could actually sit around and watch six hours of it. And that's not inclusive of the PC-based time. That's just on the large screen TVs. Um, so, you know, so it's, it's, and most people take it for granted. You know, you turn, it's like water or turning on the lights. You know, you turn, flip the switch and it kind of comes down the, out and through the display and you really don't know what, exactly what it is. So I thought today what we could do is we could go through um, some slides that kind of talk to what video is and isn't. Um, and this lecture, I've done it before, and it takes usually an hour and a half to get through the, all of the slides, so I've abbreviated it. And I'm probably going to leave out a lot and, you know, we can uh, cover it all in <laughs> Q&A later on. Um, for any questions that might come up. And if there's any questions that you have, um, you know, feel free to blurt them out. Um, happy to do the interactive thing as well. It's actually better. Now I just have to do is just get this to advance in the next screen. My laptop is uh, not happy. Oh, that goes. All right, so um, the video is comprised of a bunch of different notations. So there's a concept of format and there's a concept of a codec. Now the format of a video is going to be everything associated with the video. It's the file size, it's the file structure, it's the way you lay out your data in it. You may have a random access file, you may have a linear file that's just comprised just of bits that are associated with uncompressed video. Um, and so, so when you talk about formats, a lot of times people think of, um, for media, they think of like having a .mp4 extension on a file. And a lot of times that's the way the notation of your laptop or whatever might uh, recognize a file. Other ways are MIME types as you go and download something off of the Internet. It basically describes to some algorithm that what type of format this thing is going to be in so you understand how to play it back. So it's not just a bunch of gook that comes down the, the pipe. It's just a little buzzing. Sorry. Oh, no worries. You can hear that. This is very sophisticated. I'm not used <laughs> to such sophistication. Is the, is the all the way up I don't know. Star Trek uh, communicator. Had problems last time. All right, you're, you're definitely good. Sorry about that. Beam me up. <laughs> all right. So, um, so what a codec is is a compression and decompression algorithm. Um, it's the an application that gets created um, according to some specification that allows you to take a format and uh, tease it apart um, and uh, be able to play it back. Um, so formats versus codecs because they're often confused. Let me go back to there. So um, again, formats, everything about the thing, compression is the way, and decompression is the way you get at the bits within it and then display that video or audio directly to some type of terminal device. A codec standard is um, the mechanism, the, 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 the rules by which uh, an implementation of a codec are built. Um, the codec standards can either be open uh, standards or closed standards. Uh, so, for example, a Microsoft uh, Windows Media 9 is a closed standard uh, codec where, versus uh, MP4, which is an open standard codec that's used. Um, and everybody's kind of doing this a lot. And it, you know, being your age group and your, uh, everybody's proficiency with laptops, everybody sort of does a lot of uh, work with codecs, right? You know, so you kind of take a movie and you kind of rip it down and stick it on top of your iPod, maybe. Uh, maybe you're watching, you know, you're taking music and you're um, and uh, compressing that and changing it to different formats. Everything that you're doing there is really um, based upon certain uh, open or non-open uh, specifications. Uh, so the specifications might say, okay, well, the way that this data is laid out within the file, um, it has a table in the front of the file, and in the table in the front of the file, it's got information about a pointer to an offset that says, okay, here's where your 
uh, title, your artist, your uh, lyrics of the song are going to be located. And if your codec that's actually implementing the uh, decoding of that stream um, is compliant to that specification, it'll be able to pull all that data out. So some of you probably, when you've ripped CDs before, have um, experienced a loss of that metadata. Like you rip an MP3 file, I don't even know if the people do that anymore, but we rip MP3 files all the time. When you rip the MP3 file, if the codec is not um, completely adherent to a specific specification, what ends up happening is you might lose the metadata associated with that specific song, right? So you might not get the artist that's playing on the LCD display anymore. It might just say something song title. That's partial implementation of the codec. You actually ripped out the audio stream, but you didn't get full implementation of the codec by missing the metadata associated with it. Um, I'm going to go through some of these more quickly. Um, common codec related operations that you might see are things like transcoding, recoding, encoding, and decoding. All essentially the same kinds of um, ideas from different angles. You're implementing an algorithm that's going to be able to open up a file stream um, that's based in a specific format um, and decode that specific format, put it into a neutral format, and then re-encode it into a new format on the other side. So if you're coming in a WAV file, an uncompressed audio, and you open that thing up, now you're going to go out and re-encode it and put it into an MP3 file format, for example, in a new codec with additional compression. So what does all this have to do with video? Um, so video is um, the technology of capturing what had been uh, a um, uh, set of motion pictures, um, uh, of pictures that are actually um, set uh, one in sequence after another that describe a certain action. Um, when you do an analog film at a movie theater, um, the frames go by sequentially and each is a complete uh, image um, in sequence. Um, now what's happened with digital video is that we've actually changed that. Um, we've made it so that the, uh, the uh, shows, the, excuse me, the, the, the frames that are being uh, shown are full frames and then partial frames that are being uh, transmitted. So, um, so that's all digital. So you've got original analog, which is all one frame after another. You've got uh, a brand new digital that is uh, one uh, full frame and then partial frames. And then you've got uh, older VHS technology, which has a set of time sequenced uh, data output representing a video um, uh, on a uh, storage medium. Characteristics of video. In the US, we do 29.97 frames per second of video. Uh, in France, um, we use 25 frames per second. That's just a standard that's used um, for uh, the TV sets. Um, it was originally developed uh, based upon older analog technology as we uh, sent uh, video over the air um, to be transmitted on cathode ray tubes. Uh, that they came up with 29.97 as the, uh, um, the frame rate to use. All right, so in... Um, and video is not the most exciting thing in the world. The reason why people don't talk about it too much. You know, it's a, it is a kind of a dry subject. But um, so what we're trying to do here is uh, show a um, uh, version of what a uh, video would look like. Um, and it's been enhanced here with, by slowing down the frame refresh um, with uh, interlaced and line doubling technology. Um, so in older television sets, uh, not the HD television variants, um, the way that uh, the signal was sent across was through interlaced um, uh, technology. So basically you'd write from top to bottom every other line. And so what ends up happening is you have that sort of um, interesting um, uh, flicker that occurs on the screen. Um, and that actually is it's more visible here because we slowed the, the refresh rate down. Um, but um, on a standard television set, um, it actually it does bother a certain percentage of the population, the actual flicker of, of the screen. Um, what people did initially is they started doing line doubling technology, um, basically doubling up every one of the, um, uh, the, the bars across the screen so that um, it masks the flicker. But it also causes a blurring um, of, the, of the image because of the redundant data that's being sent. Um, 
with anti-aliasing, so and, and progressive scan, what's happening instead, as opposed to interlacing, is that it's actually like a, um, it's painting as if um, you're painting from the top down um, on the screen. Um, from the top uh, uh, row all the way down to the bottom row of the video. And it actually provides a, a very realistic view of the, of the original image that's being sent. Um, with anti-aliasing, which tries to remove a lot of the artifacts. So when you talk about aliasing, you're talking anti-aliasing, you're talking about um, removing the um, uh, artifacts of motion within a video. Um, and the way you do that is there's a mathematical formula that you apply to a specific uh, set of data that's being sent down. And you weed out the, um, fo the, the data that's above and below a specific band um, that's acceptable. Um, so uh, with that, what ends up happening is you lose some of the clarity. So we have here at the top across the top is the original with um, the progressive scan, uh, the interlaced, and the line doubling. And then again with anti-aliasing and the same across the web bottom. On TVs today, um, when you have a 1080p or 720p signal, it's going to look like the top left-hand corner. If you have 1080i, it's going to look similar to the top middle. That's the interlaced signal. I wanted to show you about here is a bit about the video compression. Okay, so um, video compression works with uh, these uh, so-called I-frames, P-frames, and B-frames. <coughs> Most of the, the work that's done on video is done with I and P frames. Now, I frames are a full image. So what ends up happening is you send a, um, every n number of frames that are sent down to the edge device, you send a complete image. And that becomes your reference frame. Um, so, you take, so if you were developing a software algorithm for this, what you do is and when you, you find the I frame, and it's a complete JPEG image. Almost the same as if you'd just taken a picture from a camera. And it's this contiguous set of bits that are sent down. So you get this long sequence of bits that represent that frame. And you got a pointer in memory to that set of bits. So what you do is you hold on to that pointer. Right? And then what comes after that are predictive frames, P-frames. Now these are deltas off of the original I-frame. So you got your memory pointer, and now you got this additional set of data that's being sent down. Now every one of the P-frames can be um, almost as much data if there's a lot of changes in the screen as the original iframe, but generally they're much less. Generally you have very, very small amounts of changes on a frame by frame basis. Because it's going at 29.97 frames per second. And your eye can't really keep up. If they change the frame every you know, 30 milliseconds, your eye wouldn't be able to keep up with it. It would just flicker from one screen to the other. So what you do is you take your original pointer to your original iframe, you hold on to that, and you apply the delta that's coming off of each of the P frames to it. And there's a bunch of algorithms to do that. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a second. Oh, and the B frame is predictive frames. Is that, believe it or not, you can send the frame before. So you got the I frame. And then you want to send a frame that comes in. You want to send a frame down that says, here's a frame, hold on to it. And I want you to apply the I frame and the P frames that are subsequent to this original B frame. So it's a, it's a before frame. Uh, on video compression. So all of the iframes um, and B's and P's are actually um, uh, met, uh, stacked up in a group of pictures. Okay? So in, in our world we call that a GOP. Um, so you have this GOP structure. Everybody talks about GOP structures in my world. So what you do is you say, okay, well what's your GOP size? You say, well my GOP size is um, 20 frames. That means that's the interval at which the iframe will be then sent. And you could change the GOP size um, depending upon uh, how you want to configure your network. I don't know how much I want to say about this. But what do you think happens when you reduce your GOP size in terms of the size of the... You just saw a second ago that uh, I saw at the tail end of the lecture where you're talking about large bandwidth, little bandwidth. Do you think it increases or decreases the bandwidth if you decrease the GOP size? Size, size will increase, right? Because you're sending a lot more iframes, right, down the stream. So one of the things you can play around with a lot when you're doing your trickery and trying to reduce the, the sizing of the video is if you have this one contiguous set of video image, you can increase your GOP size. So you, have, you send out the iframe would only come n number of frames away from each other. Um, okay, great. So, um, like I was saying, the, um, the, 
you can write an algorithm that will save that iframe and then compare the p-frames to it, right? And then if you took the original iframe, um, if you took two frames of video that were already decoded, frame one and frame two, and you sur subtracted frame one, frame two, you get the delta, right? You get the delta of what's changed between the two frames. And that would illustrate what a p-frame looks like, right? It would be the same as what the p-frame delta is going to be. So that's what I did here. Basically, um, I took some webcam video that I shot um, and wrote a quick application that would take the iframes and compare them um, and then show you what the delta is going to be. And that way you can see what video sort of is. And I just have to uh, get it to play. I'm getting a... There it goes. if you would be so kind. So, um, first frame, then subtracted second frame from it. The data that's, that you see is only the data that's being transmitted between frames. So again, very scant amount of data that's actually being transmitted between the frames. Some common video codecs um, and formats um, for uh, distribution of video um, are listed here. I'm not going to go through them all. One thing that, that's interesting about it, um, or at least I find interesting, is that sometimes the format of a video is actually the same name as the codec associated with the video. So uh, does anybody know what codec is used or format is used um, in uh, the bulk of worldwide television transmission? MPEG-2. MPEG-2 is the one that's being used. And MPEG-2 actually happens to be the format name as well as the codec name, the compression algorithm that's used for uh, decoding and encoding the, the video. Um, other common codecs are uh, MPEG-1. It's very low compression. MPEG-4, which has additional compression associated with it. The big thing that's coming up is HEVC, uh, H.265. Um, so, um, why are these things so important? Um, so I'm trying to put a little context around it. Um, when you have a big, big, big bandwidth pipe to transmit video down to the edge um, of the network, um, what you always want to be able to economize on the amount of bits that are being sent on a per stream basis so that you can um, put more content out. So it might be the difference between offering out 700 channels of video down to a customer versus 1,400 ca channels of video to a customer. And that's kind of a big deal. Um, but it's even a bigger deal when you have very limited bandwidth networks, like with wireless networks. So most of the country um, has a very, very small amount of, uh, relatively small amount of uh, uh, bandwidth available to it via wireless. So if you use you know, Verizon or AT&T, um, the amount of bandwidth that they actually own, licensed to, um, is 100 plus megahertz, somewhere in that area. But they don't use it all for one purpose. They use it for a myriad of purposes, voice, text, data, video. Um, versus like a cable plant where you know, there's a gigahertz on the plant, on the cable. Um, and so there's 10 to 1 ratio and so it's more impactful to have more higher compression for things like wireless applications than it is for uh, cable-based applications. Um, and with, uh, with relative to that, what's happening is that there's new codec coming out. So every time they come up with a new codec, it's got bigger and bigger bandwidth efficiencies, right? You, you're basically creating um, stronger algorithms to encode the data, right? Um, so what does that do to CPU utilization, you think? on the, the client device. What does that require? Yeah, a lot more, right? Yeah, the more, the more compression you've got, the more horsepower you need to tease it apart, the compressed video, and actually represent that data. So what's happening is if you looked at a sort of a graph, it said compression going up like this in terms of the bits per second compression capability, you see that the CPU utilization or the CPU capabilities also have to keep in pace with it. So that whole Moore's Law, what's happening is, right, so you've got algorithms that are becoming more and more uh, capable of being implemented because of the efficiencies that are people getting on, the, on CPUs these days. The next big thing will likely be H.265, and H.265 will allow us to get effectively almost a 50% drop in bandwidth 
on uh, wireless networks uh, and any other kind of network that implements it. But it's going to be mostly implemented on the wireless side. And some folks are saying, look, you know, it's at 39% uh, for random access scenarios and 44% for low delay scenarios. And that's a pretty significant drop. That you can equate that to capital expenditures on wireless networks and also at our own network as well, uh, like a Comcast network. Um, I'll go through two more slides um, and, um, that I find interesting. Um, if, if you wanted to look at a, a, a video that's being transmitted down a network, it turns out since the formats are well um, defined, you can build software that can tease it apart, which is kind of cool. So there's an MPEG-2 transport stream, right, that gets sent out. And a transport stream is this one big contiguous set of bits that are sent out. And each of the bits come in a little bit of a payload, an MPEG um, uh, packet. And in each of the packets, they have their, there's a little header file, a little information about what kind of packet it is. And you've got, we've got software um, at the company, and we can build software ourselves, that actually can analyze each of those packets that are being sent down the network. Um, so in this particular scenario, what we've got is um, a, uh, the PAT, the PMT, and then specific video stream data itself. So this is, what this is doing is it's tuning to a specific MPEG-2 transport stream, which is a 38 megabit plus stream, occupying a 6 megahertz bandwidth slice of RF spectrum on our plant. You pull that off, and you tease out from that a set of bits. And in that set of bits, it has a bunch of these tables, and you can actually output what exactly is playing. So in this particular one, you got the program association table says, okay, we've got 19 programs. If you look up at the top, number of programs, 19. That's because the a program association table says, okay, here's all the PMTs I have. The program map table then says, okay, well, in, each, in this specific program, program number 993, well, 993 is not open, 992, I've got a data section with PCR, and I've got section 2817 DSMC CCU web messages. So that specific one is very data oriented. It's not video, even video. On this one over here, I can't see the number on it, but in this PMT, there's actually video data and audio data. And there's also some additional data down here, um, which might be SCT35 metadata. What it's supposed to show you um, is that in one set of contiguous stream bits, you can tease it apart and actually set up, see every one of the elementary streams that are being sent down the path. And this is the way you can actually get access to all those things. So, um, so I'll give you an example here. Um, one of the projects I'm working on right now is one where we do dynamic ambient lighting. So dynamic ambient lighting is this concept that it's sort of like uh, surround sound, but this is surround lighting. So um, the backdrop is that uh, the incandescent bulbs are going away in the United States and everybody's putting in these new LED bulbs. And the LED bulbs are made with these little printed circuit boards have a little microcontroller in them and they have a little wireless chip in them called an 802.15.4 um, uh, wireless uh, transceiver. Zigbee is the trade name for it. And you can actually send messages to the light bulbs and tell them to change colors. You can send them uh, a thing that says, okay, change red, change blue, change green. And they walk, work on a very, very low latency. Uh, so what I've been working on is building a video editor that will um, allow a lighting designer to apply certain lighting characteristics to surround a video stream. So what you can do then is, uh, amongst other things, is when a video plays, you can encode lighting data in the MPEG-2 transport stream as an elementary stream, send it down to the edge device, the set-top box, and when the edge device then reads in that MPEG-2 transport stream, it looks at the PAT, looks at the PMT, and then in the PMT it says it's looking for a, um, in, uh, this EBIF, uh, E-I-S-S data is what we call it, um, a lighting signal. And then it teases that apart, reads it, and then wirelessly communicates with the light bulbs. So we have a working prototype now where you know, it, we play this reel, and when the police cars go by, the lights in the room flash red and blue, and uh, when dawn comes, it, the lights come up and dust, the lights go down, and there's all kinds of fancy art, uh, lighting effects you can do around the situation. But it's all done because we, uh, we can embed any data that we want dynamically into an MPEG-2 transport stream. If you wanted to put the um, 
a bunch of information about actors and actresses or whatever, you can send it right down the MPEG-2 transfer stream with the rest of the data of the video. Last slide. Um, and what we do here, I said before that um, the MPEG-2 transport stream is 38 point something megabits per second. And I said before that it's layered on top of a 6 megahertz channel. Uh, that's by convention. In the U.S., what happens is the, the channel broadcasts are at 6 megahertz intervals with a little bit of white space between them. And um, so what happens is you read off that 6 megahertz with the bandwidth and you pull out that 38 megabit stream off that 6 megahertz with the bandwidth, right? And uh, you can display it in sort of this uh, graph. But each of these represents a different video stream in that, or some of them are video, some of them are data streams, and they're very small down here at the bottom, within that 38 megabit plus uh, XXX kilobits um, uh, bandwidth. But why are they different? Why is video different? And what happens if you're trying to set a lot of video and it doesn't fit? So one thing's true. 38 megabits per second is your theoretical top limit for the hose, the pipe that you're sending it down. And the video rates that you're sending in, like I was just talking about, is the GOP that we have, has uh, the uh, I-frames and a bunch of P-frames afterwards, has this kind of jaggedy look, right? So if you don't send a lot of P-frames, there's no changes in the video. There's no data being sent down, right? Just null packets, right? So the video is spiky. It looks like this. And if you're watching really high-speed um, sports on TV, it's really spiky because lots of stuff's changing all the time on the TV. So... Um, what ends up happening is that um, in order to get everything to fit into a, a pipe, we use something called a statistical multiplexer, or a statmux for short. And what this thing does is it takes all of these different streams, like a funnel, and it kind of makes them fit within a 38 megabit pipe. And it throws away some bits. It kind of has to, because <laughs> if you've got more than 38 going in, you can't cue the stuff, you know? It just kind of just, you just have to figure out what you can get rid of. So there's some intelligence in that piece of gear, and all of the television networks use this. And every, if you ever see some motion artifacts on your screen, like some pixelated data, um, that could either be from transmission issues along the way, or it could be the stat mux, just saying, okay, there's lots of data going, I got 15 streams going on concurrently, I gotta give up something, right? And when that happens, you'll start seeing pixelated video on the edge of the network. And that's what a stat mux does. Um, there's lots more, um, but um, that's about it for today, I think. Um, I don't want to put you all to sleep. Last time I gave this lecture, I put two people to sleep. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> you know, I had, uh, I had drool. Uh, but today I didn't get anybody to sleep. This is perfect. I had some yawns, but that was pretty good. So, so thank you. Need you need the ambient light. I need the ambient light, you know, just going on all the time, you know? That's gonna, we're setting that up for a hack. We have this hack week thing over at uh, Comcast. And we've got a few hundred software developers in my group. And so you self, self get together and you kind of um, uh, put together some projects. And so one of the projects we're working on is actually building that ambient light thing so that uh, we can do a demo with it within our all hands meeting, 700 people on Thursday. So it'll be fun. It'll be the first time we actually did it. I'm hacking those. They have these new Philips Hue light bulbs. I don't know if you've seen them, but Apple's selling them now at their Apple store. It's the number one Apple accessory, apparently. It jumped out to the front. So wireless light bulbs, and we'll be hacking those and uh, making it work with our video, which would be kind of cool for the next couple of days.